So hey, thanks everybody. Uh, so I'm Anthony. I run the uh, marketing uh, team, which is the best team within uh, DO. So there you go. And uh, this is uh, part of our Hatch Startup 101 series that we do all around the world. So we're recording uh, so that we could broadcast it out uh, for, for a lot of people to see. Um, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to correct one thing on this slide. And uh, when I read it at first and I was proofreading it, I had to reevaluate my life. I'm like, three failures. And I was like, I didn't realize that I had failed so many times and I have to tell that to my kids. So I don't like that word failures. I think any startup is a journey and all startups are successful. So how many folks here are either part of a startup, either founder or employee? All right, it's so almost everybody. All right, so you're, you're, in, this, you're in the same boat uh, that I've been in. So I thought I would just share some of my experiences, and instead of walking through each startup, which might be boring, I tried to come up with like you know lessons learned from all of them, and it's definitely um, you know something that I'm constantly learning from, even in retrospect. It's sometimes you can only you know connect the dots looking back, so I'm always learning, and uh, so I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards and get your perspectives and whatnot. So apologies, it's a little one way right now because I have the mic. But uh, in less than 30 minutes here, we'll, uh, we'll make it two-way for sure. So uh, what I've learned so far, uh, I've done four startups, uh, and um, which is not a little, not a lot. Uh, it's, it's a decent number. And I'll just tell you a little bit about each one, just so you have some background context, because then I'm going to talk in general just about you know, what, what I kind of, my takeaways have been. So the first one, uh, this one was right out of college called Signal. It was uh, with my brother. We were co-founders, and we were basically an IT shop. So picture mid to late 90s. Uh, this is a lot of uh, Microsoft, Novell Networks. We were setting up computer networks and systems for a lot of small businesses. And uh, we were the first internet service provider in South Florida. So we were having a blast, and we probably went from three to 20 employees and then all the way back down again. So that was quite a fascinating journey. Uh, the second one then, after I left, that was a more classic uh, dev shop. And here I wasn't the founder, but I was one of the lead developers there. So I got both points of view. And that was fantastic. Uh, so we built custom software. Uh, we had a lot of small accounts, but we also had some big marquee accounts around Ryder uh, Logistics Company. We did the, uh, the online commerce store for um, ESPN. So we wanted to buy some hats and shirts and whatnot, so we developed that website. So this was a great ride, so I'm gonna learn, you know, share some things that I've taken away from there. Then I, I grayed out Citrix, because that's not fair, that's not a startup. When I joined, it was 1,000 employees. Uh, when I left, it was 10,000, so it's 300 million to 3 billion, which was a great ride, but that's a whole nother, we'll save that lecture for another day. So. You know, everything shapes you uh, when you go along, but I'm not really gonna talk about a lot of stuff from there, because by the time I joined at 300 million, I wouldn't exactly put that at the, in the startup bucket. Uh, but after that, I purposely left Citrix and started up, a, uh, wanted to be a founder again, and started up a company uh, called Four Sense, and this was around computer vision and AI. And uh, this was pretty awesome. And what we were trying to do is using uh, computer vision, uh, we would call it human behavior recognition. So we created something called body prints, got a bunch of patents, we raised money, uh, we hired developers, and it was a pretty, uh, pretty wild ride. Uh, then I left 4 cents, uh, or we actually wound things down, uh, which we could talk about later, and, uh, and then joined DO, or DigitalOcean. And that is a company that you know, has been built up from the grassroots. Uh, I'll talk a little bit, some quotes from our founders. And really part of that and growing that and being part of the team is, uh, is a lot of learnings there. And I take all these things and really try to weave them together. And sometimes I thought I had some beliefs and then I learn a little bit more and I'm always tweaking, but there's always some rule set that everyone has in your minds. And these are your beliefs and then you just 
mold your beliefs over time. You talk to people and you might tweak something. Every once in a while, you're like, oh my God, that belief was totally wrong. I, I really didn't look at it with the right lens. So that's what I call it. So before we go to the next slide, so hold on. What I wanted to do is I wanted to do a uh, executive summary up front. So I'm like, how do I take all my learnings and put it on one graphic? And what I came up with is when I was doing Four Cents, I went to the co-founders, uh, my buddy's Chris's house, and I'd never been in this home office before. And he had an artwork on the wall that I think pretty much captures uh, everything that I've learned. And I did Photoshop it a little bit because it had some profanity in there, and I know we're going to show this around the world. So, uh, so here, take a look. This pretty much summarizes everything that I learned uh, in the startups. And um, I would tell you that's not oh shit behind there. All right, it's a, it's much worse profanity than that. But I love this because the artist. You could only know this if you're an entrepreneur. Because if you're not an entrepreneur, you would have put the last hell yeah down there. Like, oh yeah, you know, do you want to do a startup? Hell yeah. Like, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. And then it ends on that hell yeah. But the truth is, is that when you finally do have that second oh yeah, maybe you got some investors or your first customer, or you, you released a product literally the next morning after the celebration, you're like, oh crap. And the cycle starts over again. You got about another nine oh craps to the next hell yeah. So. I thought it was a great graphic. It's pretty much the executive summary of this entire pitch. So uh, we're going to talk about this and, uh, and kind of what I learned uh, along the way. OK, so uh, again, these are just my beliefs. I was going to call them rules or whatever. That sounds very um, fixed in time. And it's just what I believe now. And I, I would love to learn you know, more. And every conversation is an opportunity for learning. So let me just share. And we'll start out with some easier beliefs and then get to some that are a little more hard or a little harder uh, maybe to, um, to crystallize in your mind. But let's start with an easy one. So the first one is write down your business model first. So I do get to meet a lot of startups. Um, and uh, what I find fascinating is that they really don't understand uh, their business model. And um, they don't know exactly how they're going to monetize value. They fall in love with their own tech or their own idea. And when you start pulling back the layers, they really haven't thought it through or they really haven't um, understand the lingo of the landscape or they're writing on maybe just a, you know, this very uh, inside out point of view rather than an outside in point of view. So really writing it down and writing down how you're going to monetize the value, what your assumptions are. These are Big things, and this doesn't need to be a PhD. You just need to be able to do it on a couple of sheets of paper. All right, so I'm not asking for like you know, 5,000 spreadsheets. That's actually kind of a waste of time. All right, but if you can't describe it on paper, because anyone could do it verbally. Oh, you know what? I just want to demo something to you, and I'm going to talk to you about it. I'm like, why don't you send me something first? I'd love to see your demo, and then you don't hear back for a long time because it takes them a long time to write it down. So I'll show you one quick story on assumptions. I find this fascinating. It goes into my rule set. So like 12 years ago, I don't really remember, I got the opportunity to meet uh, uh, two folks that were, they were the head of the M&A team at Microsoft. And they would evaluate every acquisition and then report right back to Balmer, directly to Balmer, on what they found. And they were speaking and um, they said something fascinating. I kind of don't even remember their entire pitch but I remember this one rule, all right? It was an assumption they had. And they said, well, we at Microsoft, and this is at that time, and I, kind of, I don't even remember if they were talking about like enterprise or home user, kind of doesn't matter once you hear the rule. They were saying that we assume we can get $100 per person. This is the software spend that we're going after. We think, I'm pretty sure it was the enterprise side it could have been at the time consumer-based, like, hey, by the time you pay for TurboTax and maybe you have some side storage and uh, maybe you have some accounting software or, or whatnot at home. But they had this idea that it was $100. And they were like, Microsoft right now is going after 40 of those 100. And every acquisition they looked at, they would have this conversation. It was just the beginning. How many more dollars would this get? Oh, this, this is potential for five more dollars. This is $2. No, this is a $20 thing, all right? And it was just a fascinating way of looking at it. And I'm not recommending that. You don't have to do that. But it is about having some assumptions and writing those down. And then you actually could reevaluate, and you're probably wrong. 
And over time, you go, you know that one assumption that we had? It was wrong. We assumed the price of orange juice was this, and then the bad snow hit the Florida, and now the price of mimosas have doubled, and now our profit margin in our restaurant has, you know. But you had to have an initial assumption. So you have to assume things, and you really should write this down. And what I felt, what I feel is really why I say first, it's great to do this before you even incorporate. And if you have a fellow co-founder, just doing this together for a couple weekends and writing this down is amazing what you learn from one another and you gotta set your, each other's expectations on what we're trying to do in this startup. And I put here, share, pitch, learn. You write it down and then you share it with as many people as possible. And you'd be amazed at how many people you could actually just ask, hey, listen, I got an idea. I just wanna send you my pitch. It's only like 10 slides, all right? And I'm just wondering if you can take a look and, and, and send it back. So I'll tell you another quick story. So at four cents, uh, you know, our goal, all right, we were, you know, very lofty goals in this body print technology. So we were like, hey, we had some inside connections with Apple and Google. And during when we were setting up meetings with them, we also had interest from um, Johnson Controls and Honeywell, which is like the opposite end, like two dinosaur structured companies and then, you know, two hip companies, you know, on the other end. And I'm like, great. Don't schedule the Apple and Google first. We need more time. And my co-founder, Chris, he's like, what? No, we got to schedule this now. We got to go, no, 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 no. You understand. I need to practice. So we're going to schedule, you know, Honeywell and Johnson Controls first because we're going to pitch and they're going to rip us a new one. They're gonna, we didn't even know all the acronyms and ratios and what they're interested in. And thank God we did because I tell you, we were really polished by the time we got to our target. So I would try to share as much as possible don't go with your home run you know, ones first uh, because you'll be amazed at how, how better your, your own story is after you practice a couple of times. So if you click one more, the other advice that I always give to startups is don't be rosy, all right? I always see these pictures that like everything is perfect. Well, the planet's aligned and we made $100 million. The investors, if you're looking for investment, they won't, they won't buy this. And it's actually much more real if you also say, hey, but I'm worried about this, but we've been thinking about it, and if this happens, we're thinking we can fall back on this. Or this could happen, but we're thinking on this. You gotta put some of those in there. Or right, so you just come off as, this is like impossible, because your path is obviously not the one. And what you wanna do, and we're gonna talk a little bit about, the investors wanna see multiple paths home. If, they, if you only describe this one story, and they don't see, hey, there's gotta be multiple routes on how you can be successful. You're gonna have a really hard time you know, convincing anyone or hiring employees or whatever you're trying to do in your startup. That's the other reason to have a business model. When you, have to, when you go after those A players, they wanna know what they're getting involved in. So you, you know, once you have this pitch down, uh, it's something that you use a lot. And then the last one I'll say is, you know, we try to get it to 10 slides. I'm working, you know, we're even at, at DigitalOcean, you know, we're working on this all the time. And um, we got it down to about 15, you know, so I'm with the CEO, I'm like, you know, we're breaking the 10 slide rule, you know, we can't, you don't count the front slide and the, you know, the, and the thank you slide, but like, we gotta get this down to 10 to get it. You don't really know what you're talking about, you know, until you have 10. And I love this quote, you know, I think you, everyone's probably heard this quote before. I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. It's really hard to be concise. I'm sure you, you've all been there. I, I go to reply to an email and before I know it, I've written three pages. I'm like, oh man, no one's gonna read this. I need to put this down in three paragraphs. And it takes like hours for me to get it down to three paragraphs. So um, what I thought was interesting is that this quote, this side note, this was attributed to like, I've heard this attributed to like Mark Twain and then like T.S. Eliot. And then when I looked it up, it was Pascal, which I thought was interesting. He was a mathematician and it was one of the first programming languages that. Uh, the one that apparently said this first. So it's got to be concise. No one wants to read your thesis and all your spreadsheets and how you modeled out the exact cost because no one believes it anyway. And uh, you just got to get it down to 10. So this is kind of an easy rule, but I'd start with this. I'm amazed at how many people don't do that. So go ahead and, and click. So the second one um, is don't chase the money. It's really easy to chase the money because you need money. So someone comes to you and they say, hey, I know you're working on this. Can you solve this problem? They chase the money. So I'll tell you a quick story. 
So uh, I did that first startup with my brother. And uh, we're, you know, so every Tuesday, you know, we, we'd meet with all the employees and we'd give out the assignments that week, you know, uh, hey, Mary, you're going to go see that customer and set up that. Johnny has the data center doing, we did co-location, co-located servers and everything. Hey, he has that. And then my brother said, hey, on Thursday, you and I, we're going to drive out to go see a customer, you know, make sure you're in the office at 11 o'clock. Great. Jump in the car with my bro. We start driving down and, uh, you know, on the way there, he goes, hey, what do you know about um, Domino servers, Lotus Domino? I'm like, not a damn thing. And he reaches in the back seat and I'm like, and he pulls out this book and he hands it to me. He goes, the commute's about 45 minutes. You need to read as much as you can because this is what we're pitching. Right? It's a construction company and they have about 20 tra uh, trailers at any one time and they're all connected with Lotus Notes and they're having problems connecting with the internet. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And I'm like, we shouldn't do it. He's like, no, 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 we land this. We'll pay the employees you know, another like six months. I'm like, hell yeah. And we were chasing the money and you click one more time then we had an opportunity, it's like, hey, you know, there's, there's little, uh, nobody uses this anymore, but you know the old RJ45 jacks we had to plug in before Wi-Fi? That's $150 a drop. It's like, man, we'll hire two full-time you know, people and they're just doing drops in the new construction spaces, whatever, we're gonna make 150. We chased so much money for years that we lost track of what company we were. We couldn't establish a brand. We got a lot of references, but they were as random as what we were chasing. And when you can't establish something, you can't charge a premium for it, you can't, we had no focus in the company. Even though it made, it made, it was so sweet at the time, we thought we were doing the right thing. We went after that $10,000, we went after that $50,000. It was a disaster. In my last startup, we were doing this AI, so I had learned this lesson. And um, we were doing our computer vision and computer vision was based on the cameras that are already inside a building and then we would be able to track you. Um, how are you shopping? Were you looking at and trying on the Nike shoes versus the Under Armour shoes or track you through an airport for security reasons or first responders in a burning building tell exactly where everyone's at inside the building? Not facial recognition, we're just talking about body and body motion things. We were doing the body part where a million startups are doing facial recognition, we were going after the body. Sounds pretty awesome. So a year and a half in, we get approached by a drone company and they're like, hey, you guys are Perfect. You've already solved like most of these problems. Why don't you, you know, we have lucrative contracts. Uh, this is a police drone with, you know, with police and military. Why don't you work on the software? And actually when you dove down into it, they were doing some, it sounds like the same thing. So we were tracking everyone already in the building, but our cameras were stationary. This is a moving camera on a device that doesn't know where it's at. So you're actually doing something called slam technology. You're trying to the drone's trying to figure out where it's at and map at the same time. It was like totally divergent to what we were doing. And I had, as a CEO, I had to take it to the board because it was a, you know, anything that's a sizable amount of money and, and their request, you have to take it. And they're like, well, what's your recommendation? And I said, myself and the other two founders, like, we're out. Like, we believe it. And they're like, thank God you said that. We were about to doubt all the money that we put in you guys. <laughs> this is the wrong thing to do. And it was just what I had learned. I'm like, we cannot chase this money. We, and, and it was still, even now in retrospect, it was the right decision. So don't chase the money. Go ahead and, and, and click one more. Um, this is a common one. Do you have product market fit? If you Google this on the internet, you'll find Andreessen has come up with a definition of this and the myths of it and whatnot. And I love what, if you click on this, what uh, this is a, one of the founders of DigitalOcean, if he says, if you have to ask and you don't have it, all right? So I love this quote. So product market fit is like, how do you know when you've actually created something and delivering something of value? Um, and uh, I, I do agree with this. Some people think that's a myth that you really should be able to measure when you have product market fit. And I do think that you will know, all right? Because it goes, and it, go ahead and click one more time. It, it goes from what I call from push to pull, where you're just trying to get those first three customers and then suddenly you get 20. And you thought you were gonna get 50 and then suddenly you get 100. But the trick here and the lesson learned here is that you're not just, I see a lot of folks, you know, like, well, how many trialers do we have? But that doesn't count because a lot of people trial. You need the payment. But then payment doesn't count because you need the usage. So just because you have 10,000 people signed up for your gym membership, it's actually not good that they're not showing up and not working out. 
they are not actually using it. That's not a good stable foundation to run a business on. You may be making some money, but they're not actually using it. But then you actually have to take it a step further and you have to get to users being engaged. All right, so what I often ask you know, startups to say, how many complaining customers do you have? And if the answer is like, oh no, we're, we're, we're awesome. You know, customers rarely complain. I'm like, oh, okay. Then that's the next one. They're like, oh my God, customers are complaining all the time. I'm like, oh, tell me more. Because the complaining customer is engaged. They, they really want this to work. They really want the solution. So however you measure engagement, that's what you're trying to measure. So if you're stopping short and you're trying to figure out product market fit and you're just trying to measure, oh, well, we have a bunch of alpha customers, we have a bunch of beta, or look, we have some people uh, that's already paying their credit card or they're, they're eating at our restaurant. Are you getting the referrals word of mouth? That's a type of engagement. Are you actually getting you know, uh, uh, references and in, in, um, you know, true advocacy? Are, you know, would, you, would I rather be more interested in someone that told me their blog got 10,000 hits or this other blog that only got 2,000, but there's a million comments below it where the other one that got 10,000 had zero comments. I'm like, I'll take this, this one over here as a hot topic. People are engaging, they're commenting. This, this is product market fit, whatever this idea of whatever the blog was on. So you could apply product market fit to, to anything. It's idea market fit. Uh, so that's, that's definitely, uh, we work on this all the time at DigitalOcean. And, um, and in my prior startups, I think we weren't doing it right and we had a false sense of success and didn't really understand it and take it to the engagement level. So I definitely say that's, that's definitely in my, my rule set that I always have in the, in the front of my mind. Uh, this one seems easy, create a product roadmap. All right, so you click on it and uh, hey, you know, if you're um, doing software, you design a framework. If you're gonna open a restaurant, you lease some space. So you see, you know, so I don't know what everyone's here is doing. So this is what you do and you create a product market fit and you're like, oh no, no, but I'm really good at this. So I'm gonna do an MVP, a minimum viable product. So I'm not gonna try to boil the ocean. And I will tell you, this has burned me so bad that I will, say don't create a product roadmap, all right? This is a nuance, so go ahead and click on that. It's much better to look at it from a lens of a go-to-market timeline rather than a product roadmap, all right? A go-to-market roadmap, I mean a timeline, whether it's roadmap or timeline, it doesn't matter, but it's the go-to-market part, all right? Go ahead and click one more time. So this is different, all right? What this is saying, and don't get too caught up in the examples that are written here, right? because I don't want you to lose it. I'm trying to explain a, a concept or a philosophy. This is about understanding, yes, you have a North Star. You all have a vision. One day, my new endeavor is gonna be this, and it's gonna be awesome. I have passion for it, I believe in it, and that is great. But usually, 95% of the time, it's, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty big vision, all right? And you need to get there. And it's not a straight path to get there. A straight path is a product roadmap. Oh, what we'll do is we'll just solve this use case, then I add 10,000 more lines of code, and then it have five more features. And then, so didn't I just do what you said? I'm like, no, you created a product roadmap. What you need to create is, hey, this is an entire close down. So in four cents, we are going after this. The lesson I learned, and one that I didn't really heed my board, the board that was advising me on, is we didn't have a real go-to-market timeline and didn't understand, you know what? We could have, it looks like a little deviation from the path, okay? But it's not losing focus, and it's not a company pivot. If you only tack left, then you've taken the company in the direction. But here, I'm tacking left, I'm tacking right, I'm sailing against the wind, and I'm still going after my North Star, but I'm gonna close this down I'm actually gonna do a baby monitoring solution. Oh, but that's not our brand. And you know, the employees are like, oh my God, that is that. Like, we're gonna learn and we're gonna do this and we have to close this down and get into this market. And it is on the journey. We're gonna learn a lot. It's a lot of the same technology and we're gonna get there and we can move towards that. But a lot of startups, I was doing a judging panel this morning on startups and they were just pitching their huge long range vision. I'm like, oh, that's like 10, 15 years out. Do you have some baby steps that you can get there and then go to market and what you can actually deliver, actually start either recruiting partners, getting customers, doing your learning, 
hiring employees. These things take time. Forming partnerships and a product roadmap, that kind of mindset, that inside out, we're going to build this and they will buy, is not a good idea. This is much more of an outside in. So this is, this is very hard to do. And I remember, and you know there had to be one Apple reference in this thing, like from Steve Jobs. So I remember he did this commencement speech. You probably, everyone's seen this thing. Is it Stanford thing? And he said something interesting that resonated with me. He said, it's very difficult to connect the dots going forward. You can only connect the dots looking back. So I'm even doing this myself, going, yeah, my failures were on this. So it is really hard. I myself could struggle with this on the next one. We do talk about this, about this at DigitalOcean all the time. Like, hey, if we do this, that's not exactly a line. I'm like, yeah, but it's still going after our developer love, and we're going to be able to tack back. We're, we're getting there. It's just too much to bite off. And even with our resources, we just can't get there. So you, we need to be able to tack to get there. So, you know, ho hopefully this makes sense to you. We could, we could discuss it after and if it made the point, but it's very hard to get this right. And uh, I would just urge you to just give this a lot of thought and to always have this discussion. So even if you, you know, you think you're doing it, whatever, every six months, and it's very hard to have with employees. This is kind of a founder thing, maybe with your co-founder, because you don't want to scare the crap out of your employees either, going, oh my God, they're changing their minds. Like, we're going to keep changing their minds. So it's a very difficult thing just to, to do, but you, but you have to do it and you have to reevaluate. That's my one, uh, that's my belief, uh, at least. Uh, the last one here is, uh, you have to be crazy and have an ethos like no other. So I'm not talking about crazy to do a startup. You have to have what I've found and what I think I believe and what I've experienced is there has to be this crazy, and ethos is such a great word. Trust me, I had to Google it myself because I thought I knew what it meant, but when you actually look up the definition, you're like, oh, that is such a good word. You have to be passionate and crazy about something that's tangential to what you're doing because every startup founder is crazy about what they're doing. So if you're going to bake apple pies, we all know you love apple pies. It's not, this is not what this is, okay? This is something that you believe in that will guide your decision-making along the way. Bless you. So, you know, at Signal Systems, we're like, well, we believe in customer service. I'm going, no kidding, like you and everybody else. So that's, that's, that's a red X. And in a four sense, man, we were loving our technology. We were like, you know, you know the world has gone from analog to digital, and I had this whole speech on going from digital to something I was calling natural. And man, you know, we were in love with this. So we're like, we were more passionate about our tech and our tracking and our computer vision than anyone on the planet. That is not, you need that, but that's not what I'm talking about here. So if you click a couple times, so let's get rid of these things. And let's look at these two use case examples where I saw it firsthand and I'm like, oh, holy moly, this is their crazy. And it is tangential, but this crazy makes them different. So let's look at InnovX first. Remember, this was the dev shop. So their crazy, and this was crazy, all right, was about employee onboarding. It sounds odd. Remember, they're making custom software. So you think that they're crazy would be making like beautiful software, simple to use, elegant in design, high quality. Yeah, everybody does that. Their absolute craziness is how they invested in their employees. So let me just show you something. This is 100% real. Their founders, before they even started hiring someone, they spent several months in creating a new hire onboarding process. Right? It was an entire case study. So I went through it as a developer. It was months long. And I had just come from another shop. I'm like, how are you avoiding to pay these people their salary? Because you got to pay them their salary. You're losing money. Normally, you hire someone, you need to get them productive as quickly as possible. They're like, this does get them as productive, as crazy as possible. And they made no exception to this rule. So I'm like, please, I already know. You're going to go through this training. No, 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 no. I already know how to do this. I know database design. I've you will go through this training. Thank God I went through this training. So they created an entire customer case study. It was like a Netflix thing. And I mean, it was, 
It was as if you were interviewing the customer over a three week period. You were interviewing multiple people from their, their company, you had all their statements, all their needs, and you had to design all the business case for it. Then you designed the software behind it. Then you actually had to present the so the, your solution back to the founder. And they didn't care if you were getting hired because you were a data analyst or a part of their employee you know, onboarding team, or you were gonna join the accounting department, or you were a developer. Everybody went through this and they believed in it. Then you graduated and you had to become part of the quality assurance team and just clicking on buttons and following scripts. And then you got to write functional designs. I'm like, when, do I, when am I gonna code around here? You hired me as a developer. And they were so crazy on this that you know, the company grew to about 75 people before it got acquired. And when I run into these people, we all remember who our new hire training was because then the employees had to be the mentor and come back and come out of the field and be non-billable for weeks at a time while you took the next class through, all right? And it was the most amazing thing. When people came through this, everybody was aligned. Everyone knew, not just our internal product, remember we were a dev shop. Everyone knew our APIs. Everyone knew how we structured databases. Everyone knew how we wrote code. Everyone knew how we wrote function, you know, high level design followed by functional design, by, followed by the code, followed by the quality insurance. Everyone knew how we did agile sprints. Everyone, it was amazing. And every employee to a T was like, we thought this was crazy too, but this was their crazy. So again, I'm not recommending, like, I mean, you know, this is really hard to do, by the way. But I realized there was a craziness here that totally differentiated. And you know what? And the outside world never knew. They never went to their customers and said, we are an awesome dev shop. And we, we do this amazing four-month new hire training. All right. So let me give you another example that's different. So let's go to DigitalOcean. So DigitalOcean... All right, so that was employee, uh, employee onboarding. So what's the crazy at DigitalOcean? So DigitalOcean, you know, it's, it's, it's infrastructure in the side. We build a developer cloud. So if you need infrastructure or platform as a service, this is, you know, you, you come to us and you put in your credit card and it doesn't matter if you're a big, big company or a little company and you, you use software in the sky. Pretty, pretty, pretty awesome, all right? So, but they, it's, it's fascinating at DigitalOcean and what we believe, um, part of it as well, of course, is they believe in this developer education. We don't get paid for it. We educate developers whether or not they're customers or they've ever been a customer. It is the most unbelievable crazy I've ever seen. And when I first joined, the first question that I asked is like, oh, well, you know, how do we monetize that? Oh my God, I almost, I almost got thrown out like on my first day, all right? Don't you ever talk about monetizing our developers. I'm like, are we a business? That's not how we think about it. And I'm not, this is not a sales pitch, all right? So don't, I'm not selling you DigitalOcean. You guys are probably not developers. You're not gonna be, you know. But it, it's a crazy like no other. So if you click through, I mean, four million visitors every month come to our community sites to use our forums and our tutorials. And 90% of those tutorials don't even mention DigitalOcean. They're not about like, oh, you want to roll out this LAMP stack or a Python thing. And it doesn't say, go to the DigitalOcean's fourth screen and click on this UI. It just talks about the problem and tells the developer how to solve it. And you can take that, and many people do, and go to one of our competitors and and do the exact same thing tomorrow. And we're like, that is freaking awesome. Congratulations. And we're gonna keep it that way. And it's their crazy. It was the crazy and their founders. When our two founders, uh, Ben and Moise Ureski, what, they went to Techstars and they pitched a company. This is seven years ago, six years ago. And um, you know, Techstars was giving them a hard time. Like really, like you know, another cloud you know, services company, like what's different? And I can't remember, I think it was Ben or Moitz, you know, one of them said, well, we love developers and we're gonna give much more than we receive. And Texas was like, what? Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? I thought you were gonna tell me about your tech and your thing and let's go through your unit economics and how much this costs to spin up a server. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're gonna just, we're gonna write these tutorials. We're gonna educate the, the market. We're gonna do everything for the developer. We're gonna answer as many questions we have. We're gonna hire the people to do it. 
Uh, we're not going to be able to tell you that every, uh, you know, half the marketing team at DO are, are writers, right? Tim Faust, head of our, our, our community at, at, at DO. Um, and you can't, you know, say, well, you know, hey, you know, let's, let's do this writer because they're going to they're gonna churn us out. That's, that's a, actually a bad way of thinking about it, right? So you either believe or you don't believe. We run the largest hackathon in the world, all right? So 150,000 developers last year. Do you know how much we pay out of this? It's like $500,000 out of our pocket because just in printing t-shirts, these are like a hot commodity if you want a hackathon t-shirt apparently, all right? But we're not actually driving revenue out of this. It's not like hackathons like on Dio's platform, all right? This is just open source projects and, and, and doing Git pull requests and, and contributing back to the repositories. It's actually not running on Dio. So even when I started, I'm like, how much money do we make all this? Oh, well, we lose like half a million a year. We don't actually, you know. I'm like, I'm like, I get it, I get it. It's just, you do it, you build the brand, and you know, kind of like, you know, feel the dream, you know, build it and they will come type of thing. And it is true, we have a great brand, and when people ask all the time, how do you survive? You got this Titan over here, and you, you know, Microsoft's over here, it's like, there's no way, you know, that, that you're gonna survive. It's like, no, we'll survive, right? We have developers all around the world, and, a lot of them use our stuff, a lot of them don't, a lot of them did as students and maybe don't professional. It's, like all, it's all good. It is their crazy, it is their ethos. It's kind of like the onboarding. So it's not their crazy, it wasn't we love servers, you know, and we're gonna build the best data centers, like we're gonna build better data centers than Google. No, it was, they had this passion and this crazy, I call crazy, this ethos, and you have to find it. Uh, I think that's what differentiates you. This is my, my lesson. When, we, when the startups that I did that didn't have it, we just couldn't differentiate. And the startups that we did have it, it was amazing. And it just guides your decision making. You always have that North Star. You just reevaluate. Sometimes you get lost. Like, but what do we really believe in? And again, it can, just can't be the apple pies. Like, oh, we're going to build the best apple pies. It is there's something else that's guiding you, that's driving you. And uh, you just gotta find it. You may find it a year in, you may find it two years in. You could find it at day one, if you're lucky enough. And then, and then you ride it and you gotta stick with it because you either, you either believe it um, or you don't. So uh, there, there's you know, just what I've learned. I try, to, I try to put it together. I did have another belief. I'm still kind of, you know, I'm interesting talking, it's around investors and boards and choosing wisely and the do's and don'ts, but it's not exactly, formulated in my mind well enough to explain it. I kind of know what I've learned, and um, so I'm getting there. So, you know, I'd love to have more conversations and, you know, change some of these beliefs or, or add to them, but I think I got something that I'm learning now even more, you know, from the four cents startup and from DO and working with the boards and investors all the time, and I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting some pattern recognition here and some, I oh, wish I hadn't said that or, or done that, and this was a much better way to do it. So I can't really present it as a good, solid, you know, well-worn belief yet, but I'm, I'm getting there. All right, so I, I wish you the, the best. Um, I think, is that, pretty, oh, okay, so hey, you know, whatever your journey is, so I know it's a tough journey. It's an awesome, fun journey, and uh, I love every minute of the hell yes and the oh craps, and, um, you know, and, and, I, and I wish you the best. So uh, thank you, and uh, good luck. <laughs>